Our topic today is the High Holidays. Uh, the reason for the choice of this should be obvious in any uh, larger selection of materials that are relevant to the practice, the life of a rabbi, uh, clearly the High Holidays are going to be central. It is the time that you meet the most Jews uh, at any one time in the course of your careers. Uh, it's also the opportunity that you have, therefore, to make the greatest immediate impact on a large number of Jews. Uh, it is a time which is very complicated, and I think that many of us experience it uh, beginning at an early stage of our lives of observance as a time when we need a lot of patience because there are many, many Jews who don't relate to these things as we do. Uh, I understand that, but what I'd like to actually suggest is that with a somewhat different approach based upon a reading of the sources I asked you to prepare, uh, there are some important new insights that we can have for ourselves and share with those whom we have the opportunity to teach. Uh, and maybe uh, in this context, there will be a greater and more effective communication. Um, I'd like to begin by remarking on the fact that we speak of the High Holidays as a unit, and yet I think it's fair to say we also recognize the at least slight independence, quasi-independence, if you will, of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, uh, and certainly their independence from Sukkot. Uh, when we think of the holidays, we uh, do not think of Sukkot as being included in that package, though we recognize, of course, that it's part of the so-called fall holidays. Uh, I found that my thinking of uh, uh, this whole question, the connection of the holidays, was very much affected by Mircea Eliade, uh, in this work, The Myth of Eternal Return, it was actually originally uh, published under the name Cosmos and History. Uh, and in this book, he uses our high holidays along with Sukkot as a paradigm, really as the best paradigmatic example uh, of a combination of events which he views together as a single New Year's festival. Uh, when I read his contribution on this and began to think of our holidays, uh, it made perfect sense to me that what we are talking about here is a, a single New Year's festival. And the question is, how do the various components of the New Year's festival relate, and what does a New Year's festival do? Um, so I, I'd like to keep that in mind in the background, at least, as we begin our discussion. Let's begin with Rosh Hashanah um, and see what the sources have to say about this. Um, when we think Rosh Hashanah, we translate New Year's. Uh, our category of New Year is a day, right, Happy New Year, uh, which is actually quite celebratory, uh, and sometimes in our experience, I guess, celebratory in excess. In any case, when we say New Year, translation, and associate it in our minds with the other New Year in our common experience, I suspect that we are led to misthink Rosh Hashanah. Um, we do say Shana Tova. I have to be honest in saying that I don't know when that greeting began. If somebody knows, maybe you can share it on the website. Um, but of course, Rosh Hashanah, uh, the term doesn't mean that. Uh, and when the Mishnah of Rosh Hashanah begins discussing what we call Rosh Hashanah, it discusses it in a context which is very, very specific and important in our understanding. Um, this is on uh, 16a, Ted Zayin Amid Olive. Uh, so you prepared it, you know the Mishnah. I'm sure many of you knew the Mishnah. Perhaps all of you knew the Mishnah before uh, it appeared here on this list. Barba, Prakima Olam Nidon. There are four occasions during the year when the world is judged, uh, and they are listed here Pesach for Tfua, Atzeret for Perot Ha'ilan, different agricultural cycles, uh, and judgment for certain products of the agriculture of the fields on those occasions. Berosh Hashanah kol ba'e olam ovrim lefanav kivnei maron on Rosh Hashanah. All inhabitants of the world pass before him, before God, that is, as b'nei maron. Uh, some of you probably know the JTS Torah on this. Um, that is to say that it's translated in the Gemara and therefore most commonly as sheep. That's not what it means at its origin, but it doesn't matter for our purposes. Um, quotation of a verse, Uvechag, and on Sukkot, the pilgrimage festival, therefore Hajj, Chag, Nidonin al Hamain. 
the Gemara here uh, asks whose opinion is represented in this anonymous Mishnah. Uh, and I, I think it's worth considering the range here, not for the differences of opinions which are expressed, but for what they all agree on, frankly. Uh, and so if you look uh, about a quarter of the way down the page, Tanya, um, de Tanya, HaKol Nidonin B'Rosh Hashanah, Gzar Din Shalem Nechtam B'Yom Kippurim. Everyone is judged on Rosh Hashanah, uh, and judgment is sealed on Yom Kippur, that is according to Rabbi Meir. Rabbi Yehuda says, "Hakol nidonin berosh hashano gzar din shelahem nechtam kol achad vechad bizmano." Everything is judged on Rosh Hashanah and each um, sealed in its appropriate time. And we learn here that everything means quite beyond human beings. Um, but again, emphasis that Adam nidon berosh hashano gzar din shelo nechtam biyom akipurim. Back to Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, that combination. Uh, and then uh, two other opinions, uh, Rabbi Yossi, Adam Nidon B'chol Yom, uh, people are judged each and every day, and Rabbi Natan, who says, uh, Adam Nidon B'chol Sha'ah, when this is finally reconciled at the end, none of the opinions just quoted uh, can be aligned with the anonymous opinion of the Mishnah, and so the last one is the Be Rabbi Yishmael, um, comes back to the view already expressed, Adam Nidon B'rosh Hashanah, Gzar Din Shalom Nechtam B'yom HaKippurim. Um, what do all of these agree on? Uh, unmistakable. Everyone agrees uh, that Rosh Hashanah is the day of judgment. Uh, it is no more than that and no less than that, by which I mean, uh, in this discussion, um, it is a day when we stand before God, in the imagination of these teachings, uh, judged as one would stand in a court, uh, and there is no doubt of our status in that court, because it's unimaginable that we would not stand before God and be, at least in some measure, guilty. Uh, and so what we have to begin thinking here is Rosh Hashanah, judgment, guilt, what comes next? Uh, interestingly, um, the ritual of Rosh Hashanah, which is spelled out in the variety of texts that follow, both at the bottom of this page uh, and then uh, further on 32a uh, to b, which I asked you to look at. We're not actually going to open that text up right now. Um, speak of the ritual of Tkiata Shofar uh, and of the well-known additions to the Musaf service, Malchuyot Zichronot, Shofarot Zichronot, um, and the order we'll come back to in a moment. Um, these things have a very important place in, uh, I believe it would be correct to describe this as the narrative of Rosh Hashanah. How, therefore, are we to understand the ritual as enacting our place in judgment? And so, uh, if you go to the bottom of the page, this is about five lines from the bottom. Um, Right? This is the teaching. Say before for me in Rosh Hashanah, first, verses of God's kingship, second, verses relating to God's recollection of us, um, or God's recollection otherwise, we'll see in a moment, shofarot, the blowing of the shofar. Um, but now this is interpreted for us. What is the meaning of this ritual? Malchuyot kadeshatam lichuni alechem. We recite Malchiot in order to declare that God is sovereign king upon us. We stand before God as judge who is at the same time king and we therefore as subjects. Zichronot, Kadeshi ale zichronechem lefanai. This is God speaking to us. We recite Zichronot in order that our memory arise before God for good. And finally, uva what causes this memory to arise? And not only the verses of Zikaron, but also most specifically now, the shofar. Um, what is the shofar? Um, just to spell it out and then come back to the verses. Lama tokin b'shofar shel ayel, amar kadosh baruch hu, tak ulefanai b'shofar shel ayel, blow a shofar ram's horn, Kadesh eskor lachem akedat Yitzchak ben Avraham, in order that um, I will recall, this is again God speaking, in order that I will recall uh, the binding of Isaac by, uh, by Abraham at Mount Moriah. 
And if you recall the Akedah, I, God, um, will account to you as though you allowed yourselves to be bound on that altar. What's going on here? Um, this ritual, this recounting of verses, is a ritual according to which now, narrative, we present ourselves to God as king who will judge us. Because we understand ourselves to be judged, we need to make an argument for ourselves, uh, if you will. This becomes a rhetoric of advocacy. The verses are our advocacy on our own behalf, which is why if we go to the Gemara below, the, the next Gemara which uh, I asked you to prepare, the choice of the verses is ever so important because the wrong choice could remind God of the wrong thing. Um, what we want to persuade God of is that God has promised uh, to account us favorably, to look upon us with mercy, and ultimately to forgive us. The reason we do it with this shofar, and it is the shofar which recalls the Akedah, um, the binding of Isaac, is because as the narrative here goes on to comment upon the ritual, we do want God to imagine us as standing in the place of Isaac. Um, that is... Um, that we are tested and we will pass the test. The question is, how far are we willing to submit uh, to God's kingship, to God's command? How much are we willing to commit within the context of this relationship, this covenant? Um, the answer is, to that degree, um, and now the secondary meaning, which in some ways I think is actually the primary meaning, we as the offspring uh, of Abraham and Isaac uh, have something of the zechut, something of the merit that Abraham and Isaac got by being willing to do what God commanded there because they were willing, we as their offspring, are owed by God on account of the merit which redounds to the generations. And the rabbis, as you know, um, repeat this in a variety of places. Um, and so, just to step back from this, what we see is that the shofar, um, which is the literal embodiment of the ram which is offered in Isaac's place and the recollection of the Akedah and then the very careful selection of verses which uh, note these are God's words. That's why it's so important to quote Psukim as part of this ritual. We select and quote God's words in order to say to God, God listen, this is what you said, this is what you promised and if you promised that you would recall us for good, that you would remember the binding of Isaac, and so forth, you cannot ignore the promise of your own divine word. What we do, in effect, is hold God to account for what God has declared uh, in his promises, uh, or her promises, whichever you prefer, um, to us uh, in the context of covenant. Um, we begin the argument uh, advocating on our own behalf because we recognize that if we are going to stand in judgment before God, we know that on the merits, we deserve to be judged um, guilty. Um, and that guilt carries with it a very great burden. If you go to Amud Bet here, um, toward the end of the text that I asked you to prepare, um, we see how complicated this is because uh, when we look at our own lives, when we judge ourselves, knowing that we will be judged carefully um, for good and for bad, we understand that it is for good and for bad. There are three potential categories which can be worked out differently uh, in terms of our interpretation of them, but the precise interpretation doesn't matter. What matters is the thrust of these teachings. So beginning, um, this is about a third of the way from the bottom of the page, Amarabi Kospadai, Amarabi Yochanan, Shlosha Svarim Nech, Niftachim, excuse me, Rosh Hashanah. Um, three books are opened on Rosh Hashanah. Achad shal Rishaim Gmurim, one with a list of those who are absolutely wicked. Vechad shal Tzadikim Gmurim, one for those who are absolutely righteous. Vechad shal Benoniim, and one for those who are somewhere in between. We all know about ourselves that there are few of us who are absolutely wicked, thank God. There are few of us who are absolutely righteous. Um, and therefore, most of us will fit in this middle category. What are the consequences of that? Tzadikim gemurim nechtavim v'nechtamim l'altar. 
all right, those who are completely righteous are not only judged on Rosh Hashanah, but actually their judgment is sealed on Rosh Hashanah because what more is there to consider? They're let um, scot-free because they are righteous. Uh, no punishment is due them, in other words. Uh, l'chaim, uh, they will get life. Rishaim gmurim nechtavim v'nechtamim la'alter lamita. Those who are absolutely wicked will be judged immediately too because, again, there's nothing to discuss. They're absolutely wicked and therefore they will be judged immediately on Rosh Hashanah. Nothing more to be said um, for death. Be'noni'im tluyim v'omdim mi Rosh Hashanah v'ad yom ha'kipurim. Those in the middle, all of us, um, will be judged on Rosh Hashanah, but will not be sealed, and this is the crucial piece, of course, until Yom HaKippurim, at which point, Zachu nirtavim l'chaim, um, if merit um, was found on our behalf, then we will be written for life. Lo zachu nirtavim l'mita, but if we were not, um, if merit was not found on our behalf, we would be inscribed for death, for punishment. Um, how do we get that schut for life or for death? The answer um, is in the other set of texts that I asked you to prepare. Um, in the text in Yom HaKippurim, in the Gemara of Yom HaKippurim, and actually beginning in that Mishnah, um, but before turning there, the powerful hint that we need of what this is all about um, is actually to be found in the two Mishnayot uh, that I asked you to prepare, the one, Tanini, the one in Tanit and the one in Yoma. Um, we emerge from the court uh, when the judgment of Rosh Hashanah is over uh, in the suspended position, uh, judged as guilty, because we are guilty, but without the judgment being sealed. What step do we need to take? The answer for that lies in the discussion in the Yoma text about uh, tshuva. We've got to undertake the serious responsibility which is a ritual that is more than a ritual, of tshuva, of repentance, uh, and the way that works out, and the power of it is spelled out in that text. I'll come to that in just a minute. Uh, but at the end of that process, that is to say, tshuva comes to its fruition on Yom HaKippurim itself, and before looking at what the rabbis say specifically about Yom Kippur in the tractate devoted thereto, um, it's worth our considering the Mishnah, a very well-known Mishnah, um, from Tanit, uh, which describes, uh, in the context of larger discussion of fasting, um, the greatest days of the Jewish year. So, Amar Rabbi Shimon ben Gamliel, uh, again, a very familiar and wonderful text, Lo hayu yamim tovim li Yisrael, kechamisha asar ba'av ukiyom hakipurim. There were no more wonderful days, Yom Tov. Uh, for Israel, then the 15th day of the month of Av, um, and uh, Yom HaKippurim. Now, what was so wonderful about these days? Shebahem benot Yerushalayim yotzot b'chli lavan she'ulim, on these days, Yom HaKippur being one of the two, Yom HaKippurim, um, the daughters of Jerusalem would go out wearing borrowed white clothing, in order not to embarrass you know, somebody who doesn't have enough wealth to have the proper clothing, they, therefore it would be borrowed. Um, and they would go out and they would dance through uh, the orchards. Uh, and what would they say? In rabbinic Hebrew. Um, Young men, look what you uh, have a chance here uh, of choosing for yourselves. Uh, we wouldn't do it quite this way, um, but this is an occasion for making, uh, for making pairings, for making shidduchs. Um, it's occasion uh, for forging relationships. Now, what does it mean to do this on Yom Kippur? I might ask, by the way, before actually providing an answer, how many of you uh, in the midst of your Yom Kippur morning sermon said there will be a break uh, after Musaf for the young men and women to go out um, and see if we can find appropriate matches each for the other. Um, and we should be dancing and singing while we do this. Um, uh, I know of one shul, um, uh, it's an orthodox shul as it happens, um, where something of the sort is done, but I don't think it's part of our regular ritual. Um, why this ritual on Yom Kippur? Um, it seems to me that the answer is actually quite simple uh, and straightforward. Uh, Yom Kippur is the day that on the cosmic level, theologically, if you will, 
relationships are repaired, that is to say, to be very specific, the relationship between God and Israel and between God and individual Jews. Uh, If the ritual is successful, and we'll see in a moment what success would require, uh, God forgives us. We were judged guilty because we are guilty. Uh, But God promises that when Yom Kippur comes along, we will be viewed with the greatest measure of God's love, of God's mercy, uh, and that God is likely, therefore, to forgive us. Forgiveness means that relationship can be repaired, uh, and that's why the ritual, at least in ancient times, was one of creating relationship. This is a holiday of relationship. It's a holiday of love, where love uh, on our earth is merely a reflection of a more important love, that is to say, the covenantal love between God and Israel um, on high, um, ben adam uh, lemakom. Now, the Gemara here um, really uh, spells this out in an extraordinary way, beginning with the Mishnah. Um, the Mishnah makes it clear how hard it is to live after the destruction of the temple. When the temple was still standing, the high priest brought a sacrifice for Yom Kippur, and everything was taken care of. Uh, as Rabbi Huda Nasi says in the Gemara here, when the temple was standing, and perhaps afterward, um, the sacrifice would be o- offered, the day itself would come and go, and we could be assured that we would be forgiven, because that was the power of the ritual, that was the power of the day. The Mishnah here makes it clear that when the temple was destroyed and the sacrifice eliminated, we had a problem. Uh, in the language of the Mishnah, chatat v'asham v'adai mechaprim. They atoned the sacrifices without Reservation. I know what Rashi adds here, but it's clear to me that Rashi's reflection is the reflection of a medieval Jew. The Mishnah's intent is to say that the sacrifice by itself would atone. Um, you then have mitav yom hakipurim mechaprim imachuva. Uh, death and yom kippur are atoning factors, but they need tshuva. Uh, and tshuva, we learn going on, actually has a relatively minor power at the historical stage of the Mishnah. Um, but the Gemara goes on to expand upon this quite um, extraordinarily. Um, and I want you just to listen. I know you've had a chance to learn through this, but listen to what happens when you eliminate the connective material. Um, beginning on the bottom of Pevav Amar Aleph, uh, 86a, Amar um, Rifaot. Great is uh, Tshuva because it brings healing. Then, at the bottom of the page, Amar Rabbi Levi, G'dola Tshuva Shemagat Ad Kisei HaKavod. Great is repentance because um, it reaches the divine throne. Amar Rabbi Yochanan, G'dola Tshuva Shedoche Lotase Shabbat Torah. Tshuva is so great that it pushes aside negative commandments, or at least some negative commandments of the Torah. And then, G'dola Tshuva Shemakarevet or Meviat Agula. Tshuva is so great, repentance, that it brings redemption. Reish Lakish says, G'dolat tshuvash is donot na'asot lo kishkagot. It takes, it has the power to take intentional sin and make them as though they were mere error, mere mistake. Uh, then uh, Reish Lakish uh, goes a little bit further. G'dolat tshuvash is donot na'asot lo kishkagot. He goes further to say, you know, um, a sin is actually rendered a good deed. Uh, once one atones for it, uh, interesting implications. Rabbi Yonatan goes on and says, G'dola tshuva shem arechet shnotav shadam, a person's days are lengthened, and now listen to this, this is the sh- shocking culmination. Um, lo od, um, ele shemachzik lo tova, God uh, considers uh, a sin to be a good thing um, if we do tshuva for it. Um, and there's a quotation for this. Um, and then finally, velo od elishama le alav hakatuv ki kriv parim. The claim here is that if you do tshuva, um, it's as though you've brought a sacrifice. So the problem of the temple's destruction, articulated in the Mishnah, is here absolutely erased because we have the sacrifice to offer. The sacrifice is tshuva um, in a one-upsmanship that we could not have predicted. Um, in the name of Rabbi Meir, the Gemara goes one step further and says. Um, um, for a single person who does tshuva, the entire world is forgiven. Um, this gives us the package of the New Year's Festival. The New Year's Festival begins as New Year's Festivals begin around the world with judgment. Uh, 
Um, the previous year has had its accumulation um, uh, and it's left its stain. Uh, that stain needs to be dealt with. Uh, and so there is judgment, uh, our own consideration of our deeds uh, and God's judgment of us as we stand before God. We begin the ritual by enacting um, what that would mean to stand in judgment before God and beginning to make the argument on our behalf. But at best, at the end of Rosh Hashanah, we emerge from the court knowing that we better find schut. And so we engage in tshuva, and tshuva, as we learn in the Gemara and Yoma, has this enormous power, um, the power even of sacrifice. We arrive at Yom Kippur, and either the power of the day or the power of tshuva, the ritual combined with the power of the day, um, or simply because God promises, uh, all over scripture in fact, to forgive us. Um, Yom Kippur demands of God that God forgive, and so we can be confident as Yom Kippur progresses that we will be forgiven. Uh, it is, of course, because we know we will be forgiven um, that the daughters of Jerusalem goes out, go out with the sons of Jerusalem uh, dancing in the fields uh, and hoping to create relationships that will merely reflect the relationships created on high, um, that is to say, between God and us. Um, and it is for this reason that Yom Kippur is called a great Yom Tov. We get it all wrong. Um, we do not have happy New Year's uh, in our uh, ritual, in our religious practice. In fact, the New Year, Rosh Hashanah, uh, is the most solemn day of the entire year, the most fearful day of the entire year, because we stand before God in judgment. It's only when we get to Yom Kippur, uh, when we can be confident of the relationship's repair, that we can finally smile, know that the burden has been taken off, and approach one another and God again in rejoicing, saying, that the relationship has been cleansed, it's been strengthened again, and we can go forward. And this, of course, is why the New Year's festival is completed on Sukkot. Note, Sukkot in Torah language becomes in rabbinic language Hajj. That's the way our ancestors would have pronounced it. It's the great pilgrimage. Why? Quite simply because once the relationship with God has been repaired, we want to get together again. And so everybody goes in the single greatest pilgrimage up to the temple in Jerusalem. There we meet one another in God, uh, and it is the greatest festivity of the entire year, so great, in fact, that as uh, you will know, uh, there is fear that it might get out of hand. But that's okay, because that's the beginning of a new sin cycle, um, and that will be dealt with the next Rosh Hashanah, which again is not a happy new year. Um, it's been a pleasure. <laughs>